cool. So welcome, everybody. I mean, it's, I guess, I guess it's the end of the day, so welcome for me as a speaker. Um, I'm going to talk about something. I don't, I don't know if you guys have noticed. Oh, we sort of changed a lot of things in the config system over the past 12 months, and it kind of changed everything about the way you develop in Symfony. Um, so this presentation is basically about backing up, looking at why we made those things, and, and basically seeing in practice what the end result of that is. Like what what like when I code in my application now, I, I do a whole lot of a lot of like less work than I used to. There's a lot of strategies um, that if you know about, then you're going to be able to get your job done a lot faster than you could a year ago. So uh, let's see if like my my yes. Um, Hey, so I'm Ryan. Uh, I work on Symphony. I work on the documentation. I'm a writer not for Camp University. Bam! I'm writing for SymphonyCast. Yeah. That was like my last edition. I was like, wait, we're going to have a moment here. And either they'll cheer for me because they know what's going on, or they'll be like, what? I never heard of either of those. So I'm the writer for SymphonyCast, uh, Symphony fanboy. You're supposed to say evangelist, but at some point you have to be honest with yourself <laughs> that you're more than an evangelist. And, oh, husband of the much more talented Atlanta Pelham, um, who's used to come here. She's not here anymore. Um, she's actually, if, if there's anything that you like about my slides from a, des from a design standpoint, if there's anything that's not like horribly embarrassingly designed poorly, it's because she did it on my slides. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm sort of like a child in some ways. I sort of give her like these horrible looking things and then I come back a couple hours later and they look they look much, much better. So she is the design behind this. She's also works on Kinky or Symphony Casts. Symphony Casts. Um, so she's not here anymore because uh, of that little dude. So I'm also a father of my little two-year-old guy, so there he is. Um, when I when I did this a year ago, I would actually, when he was still really young, I would spend a few minutes up here like taking deep breaths and saying that I was sleep deprived and, and just basically lamenting. But now he's really cool, so if you haven't had kids yet, um, I'll just tell you, like, if you ever have kids, it, it actually does get really cool eventually. So if you're like looking around and they're like six months old and you're like, what the hell did I do? Uh, it's cool, a lot of us felt that way. It gets, it gets much, much more awesome. If you've had kids before, you'd probably be like, yeah, mm -hmm, that's, that's how it goes. Anyways, enough of that. So, uh, we're going to talk about the service container, of course. So, the, the key thing, no matter what, back in Symphony 2, back in Symphony 3, back in Symphony 4, probably in Symphony 5, uh, the container it knows every argument to every service that's ever going to be instantiated. The stuff that you have, the stuff that came from a third party bundle, <laughs> the stuff in the core. That's its only job. It just needs to know how to instantiate every single object. What's the first argument? What's the second argument? Sometimes you have more complex things like calls, some of you guys know about. So that's the job of the container, basically to be the big know-it-all about how your objects are instantiated. Um, and so, you know, historically, third-party bundles have done this in big, explicit XML files. Like, here's my service, here's my class, here's my first argument, here's my second argument. Just a bunch of XML. And that's still done that way. Uh, and then in our app, we basically had the same thing. We had like big, explicit YAML files that had all that same information. So this, and this is how it existed for a long time. So here's, here's an XML file. Um, this is actually a real XML file. Um, so they're at least very clear, right? And this is one of, you know, the, the core XML files still look like this. So here's my service ID, my class, um, argument, arguments, and like I said, a little less common, but it's configuring a couple of calls, a couple of method calls that should be called on this object before it's returned from the container. So great, so the container knows everything about how to instantiate the Twig service. So here's some YAML from my application. Of course, it's close to Halloween, so when I made a test application for this project, I had to make it. Uh, we have a spooky word generator, and a Halloween costume creator, and a candy aggregator, and a doorbell ring event subscriber. So that's our application. It's very important. It's a very important application. And OK, so we have our service IDs, our classes, and our arguments. Um, we also have a tag down here so we can be like, hey, I'm an event subscriber. So this is how, how it's historically looked, and, and hopefully you guys, this is familiar to you. So um, at some point, somebody asked, can't the container be a, a bit smarter? Because uh, this, is, this, is, this is A, a lot of work, um, but B, this is actually a lot of concepts to teach somebody like day one. Day one, you're starting with Symphony, and I have to kind of t t sit you down with the YAML configuration, talk about arguments and things like that. Uh, you know, you need to learn how this works eventually, but it's a lot of cognitive load on day one. 
So can't the container be smarter? So yeah, so um, ba basically we're going to kind of go through what happened in the Symphony core more or less, at least kind of a disney to five version of it, uh, about a year and a half ago, what the kind of thought process was. So first it was like, hold on a second, what if we just, uh, whoo, idea, what if we just uh, made the service IDs the class names? Doesn't work always, because occasionally you have one class, or sorry, yeah, one class with multiple services, but most of the time you have one service per one class. So it was like, cool, we can just like make people stop, let me go back here, um, stop kind of inventing these IDs, because that was always something you had to kind of teach, be like, now put your creative cap on and kind of sort of make an ID that sort of looks like your class name, but is sort of different. So now I'd be like, you know, let's just not do that anymore. Let's just use the class name as the service ID. And of course, when we did that, we, you know, when you first implement that, you say, wait a second, now I have to have my ID, and then I have a class key below that with the class again. So, okay, so we got rid of that too. We said, okay, if your ID is your class name, then that's also, we're going to automatically set that as your class attribute. And if you look in the core of how this is parsed, that's literally what it does. It's like, oh, the class key is missing. But the ID is a class name. I'll set the class name on your service for you. So it's all about, um, all the stuff we're going to talk about is really the automation of config. It's not magic. It's, it's that there are just things that you used to configure manually that are now being configured for you. But if you kind of looked at the core code behind the scenes, it's all still being configured on some level. So cool. So we just, we, we kind of got rid of one little thing that we needed to, to think about. Um, and of course, this is just a standard, right? You guys can still do whatever you want in your applications, but this is sort of a recommendation that, that was made. So the second thing was, um, what, if we, what if we just auto-registered services? So every time you wanted a service in your app, uh, you didn't have to go to the services.yaml file. We just, we just automatically scanned your source directory and made everything a service. So I was like, okay, cool. So now we're gonna, we add this new little syntax here, which basically says, look at the source directory and just, just auto-register everything as a service. Um, and what it, the way it does that, of course, is it doesn't know what your service ID should be, so it just uses your class name as your ID. So then that quite literally means that we can remove that one line there, because that one line there was only there um, just to say, I am a service in the container, but it's now redundant. So basically, when the first two lines run there, the green lines, the end result of that is that those four services are registered in the container. We then override three of them, though, because we need to give additional uh, configuration. So these three down here, we're literally overriding them because we're using the same service ID that was created in those two lines. So it's like, hey, we'll, re we'll, we'll register everything for you, but yeah, if you need some extra configuration, you still need to go in and override the, the automatic one and add some extra stuff. So cool, so it's like a little kind of tiny improvement here. That's nice. Um, so then auto wiring came, and we said, all right, well, what if, um, what if we just started guessing what the arguments were to your service? Um, so if you had auto wire true, so if you can set auto wiring uh, true or false on a service by service basis, then basically we're gonna look at your arguments to your constructor and we're going to guess what to put there. Now I'm purposely saying it like it's sort of like magic, like Symphony is just gonna kind of think about it real hard and maybe make its best guess. But it's actually a very boring system. So I don't have the actual class here, but if you looked at the constructor for the Halloween costume creator, it's type hinted with this class. So very simply, when Symphony sees the type hint, uh, it goes, okay, I see a type hint for this first argument, which is app slash uh, spooky word generator. It looks in the container and says, is there a service whose ID is exactly app slash spooky word generator? And because our service IDs are our class names, there is one. So it's like, cool, I'll just use that one. So we can now get rid of the arguments on that one, and we can get rid of, this is a little weird, we can get rid of the first argument here, but not the second argument. The second argument is actually just a string. So the first argument's a service, the second argument is just a string. So the auto wiring is going to work for our services, uh, but it's not gonna magically know how to get, how to fill in that string. So we still need to pass it um, that argument. But the weird thing is, this is the second argument, so, so far, you kind of got to just have an empty string. The nice thing about auto wiring is if you supply some arguments but not others, it just guesses the ones that you haven't supplied. So you can say this one, I know this one and this one, but you can guess this other one. But this is a little weird to have an empty string in there. So we're going to talk about that empty string again a little later. Um, so then somebody um, came along and said, what if we allowed, 
that there's certain configuration we're now putting up below every service. We're like always saying like auto wire, auto wire true, auto wire true um, below all these things. Like so, what if we just made that uh, possible just to set some defaults? We're like, look, I like auto wiring. Let's just enable it on all of my services. So file specific defaults, we introduce this nice underscore defaults key. It's, it's totally like a special name. And this applies service configuration automatically to all of the services in this file. Not like across all of Symfony, because crazy things would happen probably if you did that. Just the stuff that you have in this file. So that is the same as having you know, auto wire true under all of those things. So I actually didn't put the red thing here, but just the auto wire true here is basically we, re we remove that. Um, and it also means you know, this, these two lines up here are responsible for auto registering services. So all of a sudden you have auto registered services that all have the auto wire key on them. And you're like, huh, we're starting to get dangerous. You automatically register them, and then you automatically try to figure out the arguments if you can. Um, by the way, um, auto wiring is a bit of magic. Uh, Symphony's auto wiring system, and I, I don't take credit for the implementation of it, is um, is very smart. If it has any questions at all, it throws an exception. And when the container is built, it goes across every single service in your container. If it finds one argument that it can't auto wire for some reason, exception. It doesn't even matter if you're trying to reload a page that uses that service. Every service is validated, so you can't have like an edge case weird thing, and you don't you deploy it to production. And it's only when somebody hits this one random edge case page that you see the problem. So it's validated very, very strictly. Um, side note also, because Symfony's container is amazing, there's no performance overhead to any of this. I forget to mention that sometimes. I take it for granted. It says, uh, it's all just compiled, uh, and then it's just, it's just as fast as it always was. So because we got rid of the auto wire true, this entire service was now redundant. So we're just going to take out that entire service. OK, so um, auto tagging. So tagging is something we do sometimes when we want to say our service should be kind of plugged into some system. You know, I want a Twig extension. So you give it a little tag that says, I'm not a normal service, I'm a Twig extension. That's how Symfony knows to use your service when you are, you know, when you're kind of booting up Twig or an event subscriber or a security voter. We use these all over the place in Symfony. So then we added this feature called auto configure. And because we have underscore defaults, we said, let's just throw it on top. So it automatically applies to all of my services. Suddenly, we don't need this tag here anymore. This kernel.event subscriber. In the core of Symfony, we basically maintain a list of things that say, hold on a second. If you implement event subscriber interface and you're registered as a service, of course you want to be an event subscriber. Like, why would we make you like, add this tag here? Like, what else could you possibly be? So when your service is auto-configured, we see the, we actually look at the interface that your class is implementing, and if it matches one of those kind of in that map, then you automatically get that tag. So you, you'll see, so you basically won't see tags uh, very often in Symfony anymore. There are still some cases where you need to add extra metadata, so you will have to add a tag, but most of the time it's added for you. However, if you actually looked at that, if you kind of look at this service after it was built, it actually still has that tag. It's just, it was added automatically for us. All right, so we got rid of that entire service. Um, so, named arguments. So the one thing that still kind of bothers me again was how I had that kind of empty, empty quotes argument, you know, because I only need to specify the second argument. So one of the other things that you can do now is, um, which works really well in these cases, is you can actually bind by name. So the key thing here is that if you look at this class, the name of that argument is project root. That's actually the constructor argument name is project root. So you bind by name. So this allows you, it's nice because this could be the fifth constructor argument, and the other four are auto wired. So you just specify the one that you need. Also, again, this has potential for surprises, because normally when you have a, an argument to, your, to a method, any method, like the constructor, if you rename the argument to that method, it doesn't normally impact things outside of your application. They're still just calling something, you know, calling your method and passing the first argument. So this is also strictly validated. If you have a project root bind here, I'm sorry, project root uh, of argument name here, and there isn't an argument with that name, exception on every page. If um, you renamed, uh, you forgot to fill this in for some reason, you actually forgot to add this. So you basically have one argument on your service, which Symphony can't auto wire. Like I mentioned earlier, exception. Everything has to match up perfectly, or else you're going to get an exception on every single page. 
Um, cool, so that kind of cleans that up at least a little bit, so we're binding by the, uh, by the name of it. Um, so then I kind of took this up one level and said, what if we could apply that same arguments idea to defaults? I think there's laughing there. It's like, this is getting sort of absurd. Uh, so there's a new key called bind. And by the way, all the things under <laughs> underscore defaults can actually be applied to individual services, as I kind of mentioned earlier. So you can actually have bind uh, under your individual service. Bind and arguments, there's a subtle difference between them. They're basically the same. Bind and arguments kind of basically do the same thing. So up here we have a bind key, and now we work everywhere in our project, if we have an argument that's called project root, then it's going to be past that value. Well, every, everywhere in our project, all of our services. So instead of configuring like service by service by service, you start making project-wide conventions. Because most of the things you're going to do in a service is going to be auto-wired. Most of the time we're in a service and we need access to another service. So we type into it and we just keep working. Great. Occasionally, 5% of the time, you need something that's not auto-wireable. It's a scalar thing. So for those things, then you can say, you know what, let's just set this up as a project-wide uh, thing. And then if we ever need the project root again, we can just do dollar sign project root and it's going to be uh, automatically passed to us. If that makes you uncomfortable, Cool, just you know, set the argument for that one service if you don't want to make a project-wide kind of default there. Um, so, final result is this. And more importantly, this so is something that um, uh, was a, like a, a, real, a, a real specific goal for Symphony 4, is that we wanted to reduce context switching. We wanted to keep you inside of your actual business logic code instead of constantly switching to framework code. So I kind of, I kind of walked through this and I said, okay, if I was actually developing this from scratch, I, you know, I created the first class and then I created the second class and then they added an argument to, to do dependency injection. There were seven times that I had to, had to switch from my code back to the YAML file to configure something, then back to the code, then back to the YAML file, back to the code, over and over and over again. Uh, with this system, I did it one time. I created one class, I created another class, I type into the first class in this one, so it got auto-wired, I did it again over here, and then at some point, I suddenly made an argument that was called, a string argument called project root. Boom, that was the first time when I refreshed the page, it simply said, you need to do something else. The first and only time. And it specifically says something like, argument two to the construct method of this service is missing, you need to uh, manually uh, configure it, because there's no type net. So it tells you exactly what you need to do, and you can run over here and take care of it. So the context switching, you know, like I put up here, we only wrote two lines of code. That's cool, um, but this is really the, the goal here. We can just stay focused on what we're actually working on. Fabian talked about that this morning. He was talking about the messenger. He was talking about how you can basically create a class. It implements this uh, kind of handler interface, and Symfony instantly knows that this is a, a handler for your messages. Uh, in fact, the, the messenger goes a step further where you have a, an invoke method and you're type ended with the uh, message class. So not only in that case does Symfony know that you're a message handler, but it knows automatically which message you're handling. So you can just pass in a message and, uh, and create a class that has those type hints and, and everything's kind of wired up. And of course, all of this is optional because all of the stuff you've done before, that's really still the low-level code. This is all this optional stuff built on top. Um, which you can use and not use. And we have screencasts that talk about that, how you kind of migrate uh, little by little to the new system without having to kind of you know, opt into all of this all at once. Um, this is not really an extra feature, but it's an extra detail that I want to talk about, private services. So one other thing you'll see is public false on the defaults. Uh, and in fact, that's actually not even needed in Symphony 4. In Symphony 4, this public false thing has always existed, but it defaulted before Symphony 4 to public true. And in Symphony 4, it uh, defaults to public false. That basically means, and it doesn't sound like a feature, it just sounds like something that Symphony is trying to do to make your life more difficult. Uh, but it actually means that when your service is public false, that you can't fetch it out of the container anymore. Container error git doesn't work. Container error git is basically dead. We've killed it. it. It still works sometimes. If you have a service that's public, and when you use third-party bundles, a lot of times those bundles still make public services. Um, but most of the services are increasingly private, and all the um, services that you create are going to be private. The reason we killed this, it's not even the reason we killed it, it's, it's the other way around. 
in a, in a perfect world, I mean, what Symfony tries to help all of us do is write decent code. Get our job done quickly, but write decent code at the same time. So if you're going to write like perfectly object-oriented coding, you're going to use dependency injection everywhere. You're going to create a service, you're going to add constructor arguments to the exact things you need, and that's how you're going to code. But before Symfony 4, there was a couple places where that was a total pain in the butt, like your controller. Before Symfony 4, you could register your controller as a service, and you could uh, wire all of your dependencies to the constructor. It was a pain in the butt, so we didn't recommend it. Because uh, just, you know, it's, it's kind of glue code, so it's kind of one place where it's sort of okay to cheat a little bit. So instead, we basically made it possible to fetch your services directly out of the container. So, okay, don't use dependency injection in your controller. I'll just pass you the entire container, and then you can just fetch out what you want. But then please use it everywhere else. Please use dependency injection you know, in your services and other places. So this always kind of existed as a, almost a developer experience thing to make life a little bit more pragmatic in the areas that matter. But that's all gone now. Because with the auto-wiring, auto-registration stuff, it's actually even easier to do things correctly. So let's see here. Actually, I'm going to come back to this. Sorry, I'm going to go out of order because this is really relevant. I'm going to come back. Don't worry. I just realized I should have put this in a different order. So uh, this is uh, an a example of our controller. This is the way that we used to get services out. Or maybe you use the git shortcut. Um, that's dead. Again, you can do it depending on your situation if the service is public. But don't do that. You don't need to anymore. Um, so this is what you can do now. It's still not great because, uh, again, we want to be very pragmatic in our controllers. But remember, your controller in Symfony 4 is now a service because everything in your source directory is automatically a service. So it means you can go to your controller today and add a construct function, give it the type hint, and boom, that service is going to be automatically passed to you without touching any configuration. So it's lowered that, thing, that cognitive, well, basically the load of, uh, of doing the work. So we could do dependency injection here, but because controllers are kind of special, we really want things to be easy, um, that's why we've actually added, just for controllers, this action injection. So you can do the dependency injection trick, but you can actually do it as an argument to your method. It's the only place this works, controllers are special, and if you don't like this or don't even remember this exists, you can always do the proper constructor dependency injection. That works everywhere. And then there's this one little extra feature um, right here. So this is the reason we can make our, our services private and basically kill container git. Because this is even easier than container, this is shorter and easier than container git. You also get auto-completion because you're typing again against that. Uh, people probably use editors where you say container error git service name, and then your editor doesn't know how to auto-complete the next thing because it doesn't know what, that, what, what got out of the container. The PHP Storm Symphony plugin worked around that, uh, but it was always kind of a workaround. You know, we have proper types here to make life easier. All right, let me back up here. Ba, 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 ba. Yeah, that's where we work. Okay. So a couple other small things that, that, come, that are relevant with this. Um, most of the time, you have just one service per kind of type, uh, but that's not always the case. The perfect example is the logger. You guys may or may not know this because it's not necessarily that important. So there's actually more than one logger in the container. There's like this main one, which we usually use, but there's also these other loggers. Um, they're called logger channels. They're almost like logger categories. So when a doctrine logs something internally, it's actually using a different logger, and it kind of puts it in this, log in this doctrine category. Um, and they all end up in the same log file, but it's done this way because you can technically configure the doctrine logs to go somewhere else, and the rest of the logs go to a different file. The point is there's a bunch of loggers actually in the service container. And when you type in logger interface, you get the main one. But you can't get the other ones uh, via auto-wiring. So to fix that, one of the other things that you can do is you can, again, set up your sort of conventions here. If I created my own kind of logging channel called the candy logger, then I can set up my bind uh, to basically supply that. So I can say, OK, we commonly need this other logger. Um, we can't get it purely via type uh, auto-wiring. Uh, so we need to set up this convention there. So this is kind of how you handle that last kind of 2% of services that are a little bit uh, different. Um, there's also a new feature coming in Symphony 4.2. Where's Nicholas? Nicholas, are you working on, on the, this one right now? OK, you are working on it. OK, good. Yeah. It's done, actually, but he needs to add a, a, a way to see the debug information. Um, so what I just said is in Symphony 4.2 is actually going to um, be done for you if you want to. It can be done for you automatically. So what I mean is the uh, monologue 
library that gives us the logger services, it will have the ability to set up these conventions automatically. Uh, and what it's basically going to do is it's going to see something like uh, a logger called the, it knows there's a logger called the candy logger. So it actually kind of set up a bind internally that says if anybody has an argument called candy logger and it's typed into the logger interface, that's this other logger. So the other one before when I did it, this is actually purely by argument name. I, of course, I'm adding the type in because that's responsive programming. But bind is actually just by the argument name. So this new feature is a little bit more automatic, kind of allows you to get whatever logger you want, want to get out. Um, but you have to do it by name and type hint, which, which is good because we don't want, you know, if we just did it by name, you could potentially have collisions or weird things. So you have to opt into it by the correct name and the type, type hint. So what Nicholas is working on right now, <laughs> yeah, listen, he wasn't typing for a second, so I had to calm up, was um, the debug auto wiring command that tells you all of the types that you can use for type hinting. Um, we just need to add a little thing that says, hey, you can use logger interface. But also, here's the specific argument names you can use to get the other loggers. So it's kind of a visual thing that's the one kind of missing piece. And this feature already works in Symfony 4.2. Um, another thing, auto-wiring aliases. This is a really important concept in the third-party bundles especially. Because remember, the way auto-wiring works is it sees a type hint and looks for a service whose ID matches that long class or interface. Okay. So if you want to make something auto-wireable, you just need to make a service in the container whose ID is the class or interface that you want to allow people to use. So what third-party bundles do is they use something called auto-wiring aliases. It's like a sim-link system almost. It, it, it has nothing to do with auto-wiring, really. You can just, if you want to, in your container, say, I have, a, I, want a, I have a service called bar, but I want to make it so that when somebody asks for a foo service, it also gives me bar. So you create an alias from foo to bar. Very simple idea. It's leveraged in auto-wiring a lot because third-party bundles will do that. Um, they'll have, uh, actually, I'll put this up here. Third-party, one of the, the way you get the entity manager is by typing this entity manager interface. The way that's done internally is they have an alias from the, this doctrine ORM entity manager interface service to the actual like service ID of the entity manager. So that effectively means that it puts a service with this ID in the container, but it's really an alias to another service. And the point I'm telling you, the reason I'm telling you about this is sometimes it's useful to actually add those yourself. And in Symphony 3.4, actually, you can actually add aliases yourself very easily. So just the service ID on the left, and then add symbol, and then the service ID on the right. So I say you probably shouldn't do this, but if you've ever, if you ever noticed that you can type in Entity Manager interface and get auto-wired, but you can't type in Entity Manager, there's a reason for that. The, you know, the, the doctrine bundle authors are trying to gently encourage you to type against an interface, not a concrete implementation. Um, but if you really wanted to, you could just add this alias and boom, you could all of a sudden auto-wire the, um, the type on the left, just the entity manager. Uh, it, would, it would work. Ah, oh, add require. This is a good one. So um, one of the other things you can do is you can also configure setter injection uh, via auto-wiring. So if you just, like you see this add required over here, this is gonna be the key to this. But if you hide this, pretend that's not there. If that's not there, and we have a method called set logger. Good for us, nobody's calling it. The container doesn't automatically call it. The container's gonna you know, look at all of our arguments for our constructor and auto wire those, and that's gonna be it. But if you do have a method, and you would like Symfony to automatically call your method before your object is, uh, when your object is instantiated, you can do it by doing this add required thing. This is the only time in the whole container system where you're going to see sort of a PHP doc or an annotation, however you want to call it, uh, as something that causes uh, something to happen. So it's not like a, not, I'm not about to show you the, all these other annotations that do other things. It's just this one to say, I want you to call me automatically. And then guess what it does? It auto wires all of your arguments. So logger interface is going to auto wire the logger. Okay. Now why would you do this? It's like okay, I see, I understand the feature. Cool. I get it. But it's not really that cool because most of the time you should be, if you really need a dependency, it should go through your constructor. Because um, that's the only way to really enforce that somebody has passed it to you. It's always possible. I mean, Symphony will call this because of our at required. But from an object-oriented standpoint, there's no enforcement that this setter has been called. So you know, the setter injection is really best for optional dependencies. And when it comes to optional dependencies in our app, it's kind of mostly the logger. Because you know, if we forgot to set the logger on this, it's not that big of a deal. The reason this is cool, though, is, boom, we can turn this into a trait. You see that? I wave my magic remote controller and change this from a class to a trait. Um, 
if you, obviously I need a private logger property, but you can actually write these eight lines of code right here, and anytime you need the logger, you can just say use logger trait. And it's automatically going to be passed to you. You can do that for any service, probably not a great idea, you know, because your code can get really ugly if you just suddenly create this system where you get all of your dependencies injected by using these magical traits. But I really do like it for um, this optional logger thing, because it's annoying sometimes if you want to log something, be like, okay, I'll program correctly and go and add a fifth argument to my constructor. So you just pop up and use logger trait and, and let's get it. So that doesn't exist in the core of something. It's something that, at least right now, you need to implement. Um, but it's right there. It's all seven lines of code. Uh, we already did action injection, so that's cool. So we're going to pass that. Cool. So um, that is, that's the auto registration, auto wiring stuff. That's kind of like the big thing that's happened over the past year. Um, a couple of things I want to talk about, though, because I, I really want you guys to understand and be comfortable with all the config stuff that's going on. Um, and I hope that you already feel more comfortable about the service stuff. So config and environment. So like always, Symfony has uh, typically three environments, uh, but you can create more if you want to. And an environment just basically means different configs loaded. So we know that if you're in the dev environment, we're basically going to pass configuration to the logger that says log everything. If we're in the prod environment, we're going to pass configuration to the logger that says only log errors. You know, so different sets of configuration to run our application. Um, so in Symfony 4, all this configuration, of course, is done inside of the config directory. And of course, down here, we have services.yaml. That's where we typically define our services. Uh, we have a routes.yaml, that's where we define our routes. And we have these, um, this packages directory, which is where we're configuring our third party services. Cool. Now, here's the kind of cool thing about this. This, so you notice the file name here, this is source slash kernel.php. This is a file in your application. This is, not, this is not some core Symfony class. And this is how it looks by default. The way all those files are loaded is just some code in your project. There's literally a spot, this first line here says, load all, um, everything in config slash packages. So it loads all that configuration. Then right below that it says, now load everything in config slash packages slash the current environment, like dev or prod. So there's an override system. Like there has always been in Symfony, it's just done a little bit a different way. So if you put something in the dev directory, that configuration is going to be loaded after uh, the other configuration. Um, and then down here, then it loads your services.yaml. And you know, just for fun, there's also a services underscore uh, environment.yaml file. We don't have one, but if you created one, it's going to be automatically picked up. And one of the reasons I want to show you that this is in your project is this is a nice system, but you can extend this if you need to. If you needed to get a little bit more sophisticated, uh, do some extra loading, or if you're in this environment, I also want you to load these other files or something, then, then you can absolutely do that because this is, you're in control of how this is loaded. So uh, just as an exercise, let's, uh, Symfony has a nice cache uh, service or cache, cache system. So let's disable caching in the development environment only. So part of, this, uh, part of the answer here is cache specific. You, know, you need to look at the cache configuration and say, you know, how do I, do, um, how do, how do I, how do I disable the cache? So the way is, under the framework key, uh, under the cache key, this is an app here, it's just a name. You can create as many caches as you want. By default, you get one for free called app. You can just use it. So we're going to configure the app cache to use this special service ID. So that's actually a service ID that's built in. So the array cache is basically fake cache. Cool. But of course, this is going to disable the cache for all environments because we put it in config packages framework.yaml. Um, so instead, we're just going to pop it in config packages dev slash framework.yaml. And then we have configuration that's only applied to the dev environment. Cool. Uh, by the way, uh, <laughs> those of you that were in my workshop uh, the last couple days will have uh, already heard this 45 times. Uh, but the names, so obviously the directory name is important here, because that's the environment name. And the names of these files, though, not important at all. It's one thing I just like to kind of harp on. The key thing here is the root key. This is what says I'm configuring framework bundle. If you want to call this foobar.yaml, awesome. So that's really cool. Do whatever you want. If you wanted to copy this configuration out, and stick it at the bottom of your services.yaml, that's going to work perfectly fine. Because remember, our kernel class loaded all those files just one after another. So all those files, services.yaml, all these config packages things, they're actually all being loaded into the same big array behind the scenes. And it's the root key, not the file name, that's actually important behind the scenes. 
Um, and then maybe coming someday to Symphony, this is like a, a, something that's being discussed right now. Yeah, um, environment, I just realized how ridiculous that sounds. Environment specific environment files. So we're about to talk about environment variables, which of course has nothing to do with Symphony environments. Um, so there is a .in file, and what you're about to talk about, and um, there is some discussion right now about having environment uh, specific ones. So .in, .dev would automatically be picked up. So you can maybe have different uh, database configuration in your dev environment or your test environment. Uh, all right, so the last thing I want to talk about, and this is really one of the newer and more confusing but very powerful things are the environment variable system. So the problem is like one of our services needs something secret. It needs a secret API key. It's very sensitive, gives us access to like, I don't know, Bitcoin or something. I don't know. Super, super important guys, okay? Um, so we, we, we're going to pass it to our doorbell ring event subscriber. And so we're, we, need a, we need the API key inside of this class. Great. So how do we get that? Well, don't think about environment variables yet. Step one is let's set up a bind for this. Because this is going to be an argument that's not auto-wireable. So we're going to set up a bind that says API key, or you know, maybe make it a longer name. It's just going to be this thing, I love candy. Great. That's, we've already learned about that. But now we have the very classic problem, which we have in every framework and everything ever, which is how do you, you know, keep your secret values out of your committed configuration files. Okay? And we have this problem in Symfony 2 and Symfony 3, and we solved it with a parameters.yaml file. So in Symfony 4, well, really, I think it's starting in Symfony 3.3, um, this is possible. In Symfony 4, this is what you get kind of out of the box. This is the solution we recommend. It looks a lot like a parameter, but it has this weird n thing API key. This is a super kind of special magical Symfony syntax here, which means that you want to read an environment variable called API key. So, you know, quite literally, if you looked at how this compiled down, what your final container code looked like, you'd see something now that says new doorbell ring event subscriber, and it literally calls the git env uh, PHP function, fetches it out of the uh, out of the container. Or sorry, out of the environment. Um, <coughs> this is one of the, one of the things that's one of the things that makes this different than the old parameters.yaml system is that when you had the parameters.yaml system before, uh, it meant whenever you were building your container cache, which we, you know you have those, you can run a command or you deploy it. It meant that all of your parameters.yaml your parameters.yaml file needed to be populated at that moment. Uh, and sometimes it didn't matter. You're like, I don't know, I just put my code on production and then I run cache clear and it works, right? But for more sophisticated systems, you like go to some server over here that like builds the artifact, you know, like runs cache warm up, builds the whole cache thing, and then it sends it off, beams it off to your 10 servers. So it's a little bit inconvenient to have to have all of your environment, all of your secrets on that server. It'd be better if you could have, just build the uh, whole entire cache right there, send it over to your servers, and then, you know, somehow you have some other system that basically puts your secrets file onto the servers. But, you know, your secrets don't need to be involved over here. Um, and that's basically because, you know, when Symfony builds this container, it's like, I don't need to know what the API key is, because I'm literally going to dump this. And we're not ever going to hit that code until actual runtime. Um, so this is one of the advantages, and, and this is a real advantage uh, when you talk about, like, platform as a service, um, some, some ways that you can kind of host your application. Um, anyways, I'm going to talk about a couple other uh, advantages in a second. Um, and then in Symfony, by default, uh, there's a .in file. Symfony loads the .in file, and anything in the .in file becomes an environment variable. So that suddenly, you know, when git env is called, there is an environment variable called API key. The reason that .in file exists, and we'll talk more about this in a second, is because depending on your environment, sometimes setting environment variables is a total pain in the butt. Especially when you're developing, you, you know, you're like, you know, I'm going to go to my Nginx configuration and set an environment variable and restart my server. Way too much work. So there's a little .in file and it sets those for you. Um, you can also set, this is a kind of convenient thing, you can also set default values for environment variables. So let's say that I have an, I have, uh, an API key that's my sandbox one. And we're like, dude, let's just, let's just hard code that one in the project. Okay? Uh, it's not sensitive. So you can actually set a parameter. Because um, notice, even though this is a special syntax, this is, kind of, this is actually a parameter. So up there, I'm basically setting that parameter to my uh, dev key. And then if I want to, in my .n file or as a real environment variable, I can override that. So if there is an environment variable called API key, we'll use that. If, if not, it's going to fall back to the one that we specified up there. It's kind of a nice way. I mean, in my project, we try to keep our, our actual secrets file as small as possible so that um, people can kind of spin up quickly. So if we have a dev key, it's nice just to have it committed to your repository. Um, great, so probably uh, we made this switch from parameters.yaml to environment variables because it's like 
better for security, right? And the answer is like, not really. It's not about that. That's kind of a, sometimes a misconception. Environment variables are, are sort of, are, 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 they're kind of hipster in the deployment world. There's this thing called the 12-factor app. Um, there's good reasons why uh, environment variables are recommended, but security is not necessarily one of them. Um, actually, I talked to a security expert at Data, we had this conversation, um, and, and it was basically telling me, like, no matter how you have your secrets, there's always a way for them to get hacked. It's a matter of knowing which strategy uh, has which attack vector. If you do X, you need to watch out for people getting access to your file system. If you do Y, you need to watch out for people getting access in this other way. So, oh, actually, this is really, in general, I want to talk about how do we set environment variables in production. So you really have two options. You can set real environment variables. And on some hosts, like Docker or platform as a service, like Heroku, environment variables are dead simple to set. It's what they want you to do. So Symphony 4 just works super easily in those environments. It's just, it works natively. And that's really why environment variables were, uh, were, were used, so that we can use, we can work really well in these environments. Um, and, and of course, the attack vector is that your environment variables are kind of a, 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 very, a, kind of a, a value that's sort of on the PHP process itself. It's always possible that some, something accidentally dumps them, or some, 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 somehow somebody runs some PHP code, and they are able to read these things out of memory. Um, so they're kind of attached to the process. Or if you want to, you can just load the .n file. And this is something that we originally said you shouldn't do, but we didn't really have a reason. Uh, and then later we're like, dude, loading the .n file is fine. So if you don't have an environment, a deployment environment where environment variables are um, convenient, like you have like an EC2 instance with like Nginx that you set up, it's kind of a pain in the butt to set them up in both Nginx and set them up for your SSH user so you can run bin console commands. So doing, using the .n file is like, it's not a problem. Uh, again. You just have to think about your attack vector. Well, your attack vector is kind of the same as parameters.yaml. You have a file in your file system full of the secrets. So if they get access to your file system, then they can get access to the secrets. So it's kind of no different than it was before. So in the old parameters.yaml system, um, you could, that's all you can do. The environment variables are nice because we've also opened up this other thing. If you want to kind of set them in these other environments, you can. Otherwise, you can fall back to a system that's very parameters.yaml-esque. Um, Another method you can do, and this is something that might even get some new features I'll show you in a second, is you can also have a secrets file. Like you have a, a JSON file that you store somewhere and you kind of beam that over to your server. Um, and there's, it's kind of crazy, but there's a, a, a system inside the environment system called processors, end processors. So I kind of mentioned this class time, end processor. So check this out. Here's my secret file up here. And then I set a environment variable. And, and maybe this is a real environment variable, or maybe I just set it right here, because you can do it both ways set to this path. And then to actually read my API key, it's a bit nuts, I'm going to say read my secrets file environment variable, then send it through the file processor, which opens it, send it through the JSON processor, which decodes it, and then read the API key off of it. Go to the key processor that reads the API key off of it. It's a, it's a bit nuts, but this is where the end, the end processor, all these things, all these individual things here are called end processors, and they're basically ways for you to process your environment variables and do kind of fun stuff. Um, that, to me, looks a little bit insane. Um, like, every time I need to read a secret, I need to like, look up that 45 lines of strange text. So something that you can also do, oh, yeah, sorry, behind the scenes, this is basically the PHP code that runs right open the file, JSON decode it, read the key off of there. One of the things that you can do, I'm going to eat Nicholas. One of the things that you can do, though, uh, I think there might be a small bug in this, um, but if it doesn't work right now, it will soon, because it should, should work this way, is you can also set an intermediary thing. So you can say, I'm actually going to put most of that in another environment variable called secret. So I do all the JSON decoding file stuff here, and then when I actually use it, I just need to reference kind of the, the key part, key API key off of my secrets. So that, that, now I'm at a level with this where I'm like, oh, I actually like that. That works well for me. Uh, and of course, you can add your own environment processors if you want. So actually, one of them, again, I think from our data, somebody that works at data, you probably didn't even know this, um, has an idea right now to allow you to have JSON files where the values are actually like uh, encrypted. So that encrypted value would be an actual encrypted value. That's something you could, in theory, store in your repository because it's an encrypted value. So as long as you don't you know, also store like the master key, uh, then you have an encrypted value there. And you, in theory, could make a secret processor that uh, knows uh, how to basically decrypt those values. So it would get the API key out there, decrypt it, and then that would become your uh, variable. 
example. So a kind of cool thing, uh, if you've used Ansible, An Ansible before, there's something called Ansible Vault, where it's kind of like this idea you have secrets that are encrypted, which you can then kind of actually uh, store them in your repository, because uh, they're meaningless unless you have the master key. Uh, so there's you know possibility that you can do the same thing. Um, so this is not actually something that exists in Symfony. It might at some point. It's just an idea that somebody has. But you can also implement this yourself. It would be an environment processor, and then you just need to do the decryption yourself. So you can add an environment processor for that. All right, so um, probably, yeah, I'm already over time. Perfect, because I'm almost done. It's putting it all together. So um, you know, the service configuration, the container still needs to know every single argument to every single service in your application. It's just that it turns out, in a lot of cases, it was already sort of obvious. We just made you configure it anyways. Uh, so now a lot of that is automated. It's like you type in a new logger interface. Yeah, we get it. You want the logger. Um, environment config loading, the big takeaway there is that that code is in your project. There's this nice little environment directory thing that you can use to load environment-specific configuration. Uh, that's in your project. You can just look at it uh, and see how it works and extend it if you want to. Uh, and the last thing, the environment variables, they're just like parameters, basically, uh, except it does open up new possibilities. They're just more flexible. So um, this is almost, and talking about environment variables, is almost, I want you guys to be like bored at the end of it. Because uh, at first, you're like, Symphony supports environment variables. You're like, woo! And then, then you like look at it a little bit, you're like, wait, why was this cool? It kind of seemed easier before. <laughs> if you're using Docker or something like a platform as a service, it is very exciting. But if you're not, if it's not sort of clicking for you, um, that's because you're not in an environment that makes them really easy. So basically, you're going to use the .in file. It's going to work a lot like your old system, and it's going to work great. And that is it. So thank you, guys. <laughs> so, any, any questions on that? Yeah, Aaron? Uh, would it make sense to cache the value from those file uh, processors? So like, if you're grabbing that file instead of doing the I.O. to look it up every time, yep. caching that value. So the question is, the environment processor, would it make sense to kind of cache those files, like opening up those files and caching them? Maybe I've thought about this. It's actually, you open yourself up to attack vectors, because now you are actually like storing additional, those secrets in additional spots. Especially the, the, the made up one I told you, where it like decrypts it. You can imagine for, for if maybe if the decryption takes a millisecond, maybe you want to cache that. But now you've actually decrypted it and stored it in the cache file. So I mean, so the answer first would be like, let's see if there's actually a performance problem, because there really isn't going to be, because most of those you're just opening a file and JSON decoding it. Um, but if you did want to cache it, you'd have to think, am I opening myself up for more attack vectors? So maybe. Yeah, I actually have the, the guy that's working on it. He he uh, made a fairly with a decryption one. Actually, made a fairly uh, large uh, file and he like decrypted them, and it was like it was like points. Because I was afraid of that. I was like, you know, decryption sometimes going to be expensive, but it was like point zero 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 one seconds. I was like, ah, oh, that's tastes pretty fast. Like, right there. Uh, the end processors, those are happening at runtime, right? Not not cache. Very good. Yeah, the end processors, yeah, kind of similar to your idea. Are everything else we talk about? It's like. No performance penalty, the container builds, and then you know you could put a sleep in your code and it would work fine. Uh, but yeah, the end processors actually happen at runtime, so it reads the file, JSON decodes it, does whatever you want. So yeah, if you're thinking about an end processor that like goes across and gets some secrets across an API, it's not gonna work that way. Sorry. Yeah, back there. Um, I have a question related to the end file, because right now you can use it only from the environment. Yes. So is it gonna be Moved to also? We basically have the it was the dot in file talking about it's only used in the development environment. The dot in file file is always usable in the prod environment. We just told you you shouldn't in the beginning, and we shouldn't have done that. In fact, I'm probably the one that wrote the documentation. I'm sorry about that. I think it caused some confusion. Um, so it already can be what the the way that your dot in file is loaded just in your front controller in your public slash index.php file, and there's an if statement you can look in there. And what it looks for is it looks to see if there's an environment variable called app underscore end set. And if it is, if that is set to any value, then it doesn't load your .end file. And the idea is that the app underscore end is what sets your environment, your symphony environment. So the idea is like if you set that one manually, if, it, if, if you went to the work to set that one environment variable, then that means you're sort of saying, I'm setting all of them. But if that is missing, then your .end file is going to be there. So on production, don't set any environment variables the correct way. Just, just do, do like you always did, just push your code up there. Um, and then your .end file, it, it will just need to have app underscore m prop. 
So as long as you don't actually set that as a real environment variable, then it's going to fall back to loading your file, and your, your file is going to sure set the app on underscore m to prod, but it's all going to be loaded. Yeah, then we we'll have to move the file so uh, composer JSON. Ah, that's, that's true. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should, yeah. We we either need that in the docs or we maybe already have that docs. But you're right. Yeah, the dot n file by default isn't your required dev, so that's a very good point. So if you deploy and say you only install my non non dev dependencies, then you'll end up with no dot n file. So yeah, good point. Any other questions? Yeah, back there. This might be more common than question, but so far you're the only person telling me not to use dot n in production, and all the other docs say I should not. So. There's just a conflict there. Right? Yeah, it's basically it's, it's, one voice is it's changed recently. So uh, if you actually look at the official documentation, it's a really good question. You will see that we say it's fine to use that end in production, but it, that only changed maybe like a month ago. So we have like however many months since the system came out, like nine, ten months of saying you shouldn't. And I think that the the community, you know, correctly sort of read that and ran with it. Um, and then we changed it, and it's going to take some time for that to like percolate. So I am echoing now the official docs, but maybe not like ten other places on the internet. Yeah, you know, yeah. So we should have said use it originally. So I guess I think that was my fault. Any other questions? Dot env is still in uh, dev required dev. For yeah. That, okay. Yeah. Well, it, and, and that end will stay in required dev, but what we need to make sure we have, I and mean, it might already be there, I just can't remember, it's in the deployment documentation saying, hey, it's totally okay to use that end file. Just know you need to move it from required dev to required to do that. I'm not sure if that's there. If it's not there, pull request. That's a good way to contribute. Uh, good entry point there, yeah. All right, cool. If you guys have any other questions, I'll be uh, wandering around. Thank you guys very much. Oh, and there's gonna be like lightning talk time or a little bit. So yeah, don't go too far. Okay. Right, sorry, thank you. <laughs>